Okay, and that's recording already. Okay, good evening. I can, I can see some people already joining. Welcome to this webinar. We're gonna give it just one minute for people to uh, join, to log in into our platform. And we're gonna start right away. Thank you. Thank you for being on time. Okay, I can see already some more people logging in. So we're gonna start slowly but surely. Okay, so yes, uh, I'd like to welcome you. Good evening or good afternoon if you are uh, in the state side. And welcome to this webinar, which is understanding egg donation and surrogacy in the US during COVID, right? So a little bit about myself. My name is Juan, I'm an international consultant and I help Dr. Ringler with his patients in Europe and throughout the world. Um, so I can give assistance in different languages, in Spanish, French, Italian, and obviously English. Um, our speakers today will be a Dr. Guy Ringler, uh, who is on your screen, which is partner, his partner at California Fertility Partners. Hello, Dr. Ringler. Hi. We also have Darlene Pinkerton, president and CEO of Surrogacy and Egg Donation Agency, A Perfect Match. Hello, Darlene. Thank you and welcome. And we also have Michelle Kies, who is managing partner at Reproductive Law Center in the US. Hello, Michelle. Hello, good evening. Okay, so a little bit of um, housekeeping. You will see that you have an icon at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a desktop or if you're in a, in a phone or tablet, you should have at the top some options. This icon I'm referring to is called Q&A. And here you will be able to write your questions anytime really, but we will address them right at the end, right? So you can also upvote some questions if one of your, if the question you want to make is already there. You can upvote it, so it comes up first. Um, and uh, when we are done with the presentations, we will we will be uh, addressing uh, those as well. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I said this already, but this is being recorded. Tomorrow you will get uh, an email from me with the URL to the recorded copy, and you will also be able to set up one-to-one -one consultations with our co-sponsors. Um, so, with a further delay, I would like to uh, let Dr. Ringler start telling us about the medical part, then we will speak with uh, Darlene about the agency part, and then with Michelle about the legal side of things. So, thank you, Dr. Ringler. Thank you, Juan, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk with you about family building through surrogacy and egg donation. Um, a little bit about our practice. on my slide isn't advancing. It's always something technical. Um, okay. I, I think you did advance now. Okay, yeah, now I see it advancing. So I'm a reproductive endocrinologist with California Fertility Partners in Los Angeles, where I've been practicing reproductive medicine for the last 30 years and our practice is rather famous because we help create some of the world's first IVF babies um, nearly 40 years ago. So we can proudly say that our babies are now 30 and they're actually having babies of their own. Um, because we've been in this since the beginning of IVF, we've always attracted patients who come to us from around the world um, for the expertise that we can offer and the high quality personalized care that we offer and for treatments that are not available um, where they live, such as surrogacy and egg donation. So when you come visit us, um, this is where we'll greet you. This is our waiting room in our offices. And we've tried to create an environment that's not too clinical, 
high tech, but yet has a, a comfortable, relaxed feeling because we know that fertility treatments can bring along stresses of their own. So we try to minimize that by creating a nice environment. Five years ago, we built a new IVF lab because we wanted to bring our patients the state-of-the-art um, equipment technology to give their embryos the best possible environment in which to grow and develop. So when we met with our designers, I said, I really want a viewing window into the IVF lab so patients can see where the embryos are created. So when you come visit, I'll give you a tour and you can actually look inside the IVF laboratory. It, our laboratory features a highly purified air system, um, high quality state-of-the-art incubators, micro manipulators, all to give the, your embryos the highest quality environment to grow and develop. And since we've built our new IVF lab, we have definitely seen an improvement in embryo quality and pregnancy rates um, that we're very proud of. So this is the, our goal of all of us today who are, who are talking with you um, to help you have healthy baby born at term. And this actually, this actually is a little boy that um, one of my patients had sent me this, this photo and he gave me permission to share it in talks to help inspire others to follow their dreams of family building through surrogacy. So um, in these talks, some uh, patients sometimes get overwhelmed with all the information. And so I've tried to um, outline it into a simple form of five steps to start your family. And this is what we're gonna talk, talk about today. It starts with freezing sperm, either here in Los Angeles, pre-pandemic, or in Europe, which we've been doing since the pandemic. Second step, if you are using an egg donor, is to select the egg donor. Step number three is to create embryos for freezing for later transfer into a surrogate. Step four is to select your surrogate. And then lastly, five is to plan the embryo transfer. And we're gonna talk about this in a little more detail. So pre-pandemic, patients would simply fly to Los Angeles, freeze their sperm. On that day, we would do all the required FDA infectious disease screening. And that frozen sperm sample would be used to inseminate the eggs in the treatment cycle. For most patients, over 95% of patients, we are fine to use thawed frozen sperm. The only men that I want fresh sperm on are men with extremely low sperm numbers, but that's really less than 5% of the population. So since the pandemic, we've partnered with clinics throughout Europe, um, London, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, um, Australia, that are able to freeze sperm for us, collect the required infectious disease blood test, and then we can ship the sperm by courier to our lab in Los Angeles for the treatment cycle. So it's gone very smoothly, it's gone very well, and Juan has been very helpful in helping to organize this part of the process. Egg donor selection. Um, you have unlimited candidates to select from. Darlene is gonna to talk to us a little bit more about egg donation. Um, but in the, in the United States, you can find whatever you're looking for in terms of personal characteristics, educational level. Um, it's really important that you find the right donor for you, whatever, whatever those characteristics are. And at California Fertility Partners, we don't have an in-house egg donor database. I work with outside agencies such as Darlene and A Perfect Match to to provide my patients a wide selection of candidates so you can find the best candidate that fits your personal needs. Patients often ask, how do I, how do I choose a good egg donor? Um, all the egg donors are young and generally between the ages of 21 and 30. Ideally, should have normal body size, regular menstrual cycle, healthy lifestyle. And we always want to ensure that the egg donor is going to have an adequate response and produce a sufficient number of eggs. So we measure ovarian reserve. There's a blood test you may be familiar with called AMH um, that will predict how many eggs you will make in a treatment cycle. Another measure of ovarian reserve are the antral follicles. 
These are the follicles that are recruited each month. And we want to make sure she recruits enough so we can stimulate an, enough to grow and develop. If the egg donor has cycled previously, her prior donations can reflect how well she'll do in a future cycle. In general, egg donors who make a large number of eggs in one cycle will do so in a subsequent cycle. And this is an image of an ultrasound in the beginning of the ovaries in the beginning of the menstrual cycle. Those little black circles are called follicles and there's one egg per follicle. So every month your ovaries recruit a group of follicles. In the natural cycle, one of those grows and develops and the other ones fade away. In an egg donation cycle, we give daily injections of hormones to push all of those recruited follicles to grow and develop. And my goal in the treatment cycle is to retrieve somewhere between 20 and 30 eggs. It may sound like a large number of eggs, but I know those 20 to 30 eggs retrieved will usually end up with somewhere between four and six, four to eight genetically normal embryos for transfers. Once the eggs are retrieved, we thaw the sperm from one, or if we have two sperm providers for gay couples, we'll, we can um, have two sperm providers. We'll divide the eggs into two equal groups and inseminate um, the eggs. The following day, we look for signs of fertilization. So the day after egg retrieval, it's a fertilized egg or one cell embryo. The next phase of IVF is we keep those embryos undisturbed in the incubator until day five. And between day one and days five to day six, a little more than half or about 60% of those one cell embryos will grow into a hundred cell embryo called a blastocyst. And this um, slide shows images of blastocysts had have developed. So it's literally a sphere of cells. The outer layer of, of the, that sphere um, are the future placental cells. And on the inside, there's a little cluster of cells called the inner cell mass that, that will become the fetus. Those are the fetal cells. Oftentimes today, we'll do genetic screening of embryos uh, before, um, before a transfer. So once they reach the blastocyst stage, the embryologist will biopsy the embryos by removing three to five cells from the outer layer of the embryo. So those are the future placental cells, not touching the fetal cells, and then freeze the embryo. This is referred to as pre-implantation genetic testing or PGT. And what we find is that the percent of abnormal embryos correlates pretty well with age. So that in our 25 year old egg donors, we find that about 30 to 40% of embryos biopsied will be abnormal. By age 35, it increases to about 50%. And then in women at age 40, it's about 65, 70%. So um, this is why we, we want the egg donors ideally to be in their 20s because they produce large number of high quality eggs, genetically normal eggs and embryos for the embryo transfers. Now we see patients from around the world who come to us for surrogacy. Um, California has always been one of the leaders in, in surrogacy because it's always been considered one of the safest places for surrogacy. And Michelle Keyes is gonna talk to us about the laws. Um, the surrogates are amazing women who dedicate a year, sometimes more of their lives to help others become parents like they are. Um, they're very carefully screened by the agencies. Um, once a match is made, they are, um, they come to me to complete their medical screening. Uh, they're generally women in their from mid twenties to 40 years of age. Um, they have history of at least one prior pregnancy with delivery at term. And they're carefully, their prior pregnancies are carefully re reviewed to make sure they were all normal, uncomplicated and not high risk in any way. I then complete a physical exam, uterine evaluation to ensure that they're gonna provide an optimal environment for your conception and for carrying the, your pregnancy until term. Once they're medically cleared, Michelle and her colleagues will complete all the contracts 
and then we'll plan the embryo transfer. For the embryo transfer, your treatment is a little simpler than the egg donor. Um, we give the surrogate hormones, estrogen followed by progesterone to prepare her uterus for implantation of the embryo. And at the appropriate time in her cycle, we'll select one, sometimes two embryos, and we'll transfer them into the uterus. The pregnancy rates are high because these are really the best possible conditions to initiate pregnancy because we have high quality eggs provided by the donor. Oftentimes they're genetically screened and we're putting these embryos into this optimal environment that the surrogate is providing us. So what are the secrets to success? I think experience matters um, from all the professionals. It really takes a team of professionals to bring these cycles together and run them six smoothly and successfully. And that's uh, from the agency, the IVF clinic, the support staff. I have an amazing team of nurses that help me guide our patients through the process. Um, secondly, attention to detail. What's unique about our IVF program is we don't have technicians to perform ultrasounds procedures. All the ultrasounds are done by the physicians because I'm making important decisions off of those ultrasound measurements. So um, I, if you are my patient, I will see your donor for every visit um, because I need to collect the data that I'm gonna make the important decisions on. Egg donor selection and monitoring is very important um, because the egg donors, a quality ha will have an impact on the overall success rate. And besides her age and her personal genetics, a quality can be impacted by how the donor is treated during that cycle. If I give too much medication for too long, you can overcook the eggs and decrease the quality, which is why we monitor our patients very carefully um, ourselves so we can make that critical decisions. And of course, the IVF lab where your embryos are cultured um, is very impactful. Um, and overall, it takes a supportive team of professionals um, to help you during this important process in your life. So a little bit about COVID vaccines, a popular question today. Um, the American College of Obstet Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Society for Maternal and Fetal Medicine, which is a high-risk OB, OB professional group, as well as our Center for Disease Control, all advise, all recommend that women who are planning to conceive and women who are pregnant should be offered the vaccine um, and allowed to make a decision as to whether it's right for them. Um, and that involves comparing the, the risks that you have in your environment to potential risk of the COVID vaccine. We know that women who are pregnant, who acquire COVID, are at increased risk for a more severe form of the COVID infection than women who are not pregnant. So I recommend all of my patients who are planning to conceive um, to receive the vaccine just to minimize their risk in their subsequent pregnancy. I'm sure we'll come back to this in the, the question and answer period, but I want to turn over the program to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Ringler. Just very quickly before Darlene, uh, just a reminder that there's a Q&A icon in your screen that you can press to write your questions over there. And you can do also uh, anonymously if you feel more comfortable. Um, so now with a further delay, Darlene, please. Hey, sorry. I thought I already had this up. Okay, first of all, thank you for joining us today. And Dr. Ringler, I have to say, every time I see a presentation about the beginning of life, it's just, it's really thrilling to see. Um, I'm a parent of a surrogate child. And so without this technology, I would not have my daughter who is now going to be 32 years old. So I am one of the first people in the world that did gestational surrogacy. She now works for us and wants to give back um, and has a baby of her own. And so this 
I just want to encourage you. This is a beautiful way of being able to create your family. It works. It's a journey. Sometimes it's a difficult journey, but nonetheless, you know, the end result is, is just amazing. So thank you, Dr. Ringler, for what you do. I've been working with Dr. Ringler for 20 years, more than 20 years, actually. And um, we really love working with his practice. So we're located outside of San Diego. We work with donors throughout the nation. And we work with surrogates primarily in California or Nevada because of the laws and because we like to be more involved with our surrogates. This is one of our couples. And if you have seen the video uh, documentary about Jens and Andreas, uh, down here is Rose. And she was in the documentary. She was their donor. She is the head of my surrogate um, program. She has been a donor a couple of times. This is a family from Germany. And um, sorry, let me just shut this off. Um, she donated to them and um, they now have two children, but this, we have been helping German families since 1999. So we have a long history with our German families. I have family that lives in Germany and um, our staff feels very connected to our German families. It's important that you know, we never charge an international fee just because you're in another country. We, we treat you the same as our um, national couples, families. This is Susan, another person from the documentary. And this is her giving birth for one of her surrogacies that she was involved in before she began to work for us. And she's holding the hand of the intended father as she's in labor. And our goal in surrogacy relationships is for you to have an, a relationship that meets your needs and the surrogate's needs. So in this case, they became very bonded together and he was there at the delivery. Um, and one of the things that Dr. Ringler already went over was the requirements for the surrogate. What I want you to understand about agencies is that we are the information gatherers. We gather everything and then we give this information to the, the people who will then screen your surrogate or donor. So we get profiles, we get OB clearance, we get previous delivery records. We um, do a home visit, although during COVID, we're not able to go into their home right now. Um, we also get criminal and civil background checks and we obtain the psychological clearance. We give all of this to Dr. Ringler or whichever clinic you're working with. They review all the records and they make the final determination of who is a good candidate. So while it's the agency's responsibility to do our best, I know what Dr. Ringler wants in a candidate. And so I don't present candidates to him that don't meet his criteria. So when you're looking for um, an agency, please understand that that, is, that should be the agency's responsibility is to have all that information so that your clinic can make a good decision. These were um, some of the qualifications. Dr. Ringler went over some of them. Um, you know, we make sure that they, they don't smoke. They live in a stable home environment. Uh, Dr. Ringler will do drug testing, alcohol testing to make sure that they're not doing that. Um, and then our, we want to make sure that they are fully committed. So we have our own process for a pre-screening and only once we're satisfied would we even try to match a surrogate with somebody else. The important thing to know about a matching process is that there's two people involved and you want to come to an agreement of you know, how this is going to go. So Dr. Ringler mentioned single embryo transfer, sometimes they will do two. You wanna make sure that the surrogate is willing to accept more than one embryo. What will you do if an embryo splits? It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And so we need to make sure that you're matched with a surrogate who is willing to either reduce or to carry if that happens. Um, there's so much testing now that can be done that is non-invasive. And so our surrogates do all of that testing. They do nuchal folds, looking for Down syndrome. At 16 to 18 weeks, they do a head to toe anatomy scan, um, they do 
a blood test now that they say is equal to amniocentesis results, but sometimes you still have results come back that require or they are recommending a more invasive treatment. So you just wanna make sure that your surrogate's willing to have an invasive treatment. Termination is a hard one. You work so hard to get to this point and it's just heartbreaking if there is a problem with the fetus. But some surrogates have very strong feelings about what they will and will not terminate for. Um, so Down syndrome is one that if you would terminate for Down syndrome, you really wanna make sure you have a surrogate willing to do that. And then we go into life-threatening, severe defects, what constitutes a, a severe defect? And that's something that you, in conjunction with the um, obstetrician and the surrogate will discuss and come to a conclusion on. The biggest thing that we find that makes a successful surrogacy is level of communication. So when you, if you're a person who doesn't want to be emailing, texting, video chatting, you want a surrogate who's really okay with that. Um, in most cases, they certainly are in touch after each appointment, but we have some people that are on text all the time. So when you're, when you're thinking about a relationship with a surrogate, please understand your level of commitment to her as well, how much you will communicate with her and in what form. And that is really, we wanna make sure that you're both on the same page. A donation, Dr. Ringler did a great job of talking about what he's looking for with an egg donor. I just wanna say that, you know, beyond that, most clinics require a genetic consult at the very least of a donor. Usually there's genetic testing done on both the um, sperm contributor and the egg donor. And so as an agency, we try to get as much information as we can up front about their family history. We're looking for heritable conditions, uh, you know, um, more than one person with heart disease, diabetes, other genetic conditions. And we eliminate those as much as we can up front, but we still can't see what's going on underneath without the genetic testing. Uh, mental health issues, that's another thing to be concerned about. It's not just a pretty face or someone who's smart or um, you know, has the characteristics you're looking for. You want to have a healthy donor in other ways, mentally, genetically, um, physically. And so that's, again, a job that I believe as an agency we have to get this information and give it to Dr. Ringler for him to then make a decision. Um, other things to consider when you're looking for donors, what's most important to you, as Dr. Ringler said, is it how she looks? Is it her education, location? There's all kinds of um, things. We don't judge. That's not our job to judge. You choose the donor that's best for your family. We're here to assist you find that kind of a donor. Uh, we have different types of donations, um, relationships, an, an anonymous donation, which is, even though we call it that, it's not a reality any longer because of the genetic testing that can be done out on the market. People are finding each other, regardless of how much they wanted to remain anonymous. So we don't encourage anonymous donation. We, we encourage at least a semi-open donation where you, you talk, you meet, you video chat, you have opportunity to know her and also that she will agree to meet a child in the future if that's what everybody wants. And then known donation is you share all your information, everybody knows everything about each other and you communicate um, after the donation is done. We allow for video chats, phone calls, in-person meetings, we want you to be happy with your donor choice, but we also want the donor to be happy with who she is, is giving her ovum to. So we, for us, it's important to have a mutually respectful relationship. And that's why we encourage in-person contact. I mean, video, not right now with COVID in person. Um, then there's donor sibling registry. Do you want her to register there so that you can reach her? or do you wanna communicate through the agency or directly with her? Dr. Ringler spoke about the sperm 
source and that what he can do now in um, in many countries. And so I just that's something that you need to consider and talk to your doctor about before you start a cycle. And then this is a really important one. What do you plan to do with the eggs that you retrieve? Do you plan to use them all for your own family creation, fertilize them all, grow them all, and choose to use them? Do you want to freeze some, donate the remaining? Do you want to create embryos, but once your family is complete, donate those embryos to another family to help them? Do you want to donate embryos to research or destroy them? This is something that will be covered in the legal contract that Michelle will create for you because it's most important that the donor be in agreement. She may have to sign consents later on. And so you don't want to go into a, a, a situation where you want to donate the embryos and she hasn't ever agreed to that. Qualifications, again, Dr. Ringler already went through this, but we have a lot of other ones um, that, we, that we go over as well. And this is gonna be in the slide that you can have. I don't wanna do it now. Um, we have a Facebook group that we formed based on our German families saying that they did not have the freedom to talk openly in Germany in a, in a social media setting. So we created a Facebook group that is um, for German, not just German families, but it's starting as a, as a German uh, surrogacy connection. It is monitored by families that we worked with who live in Germany, who experienced surrogacy and um, who are willing to share their own experiences with you and help guide you through this. And lastly, this is our team here at A Perfect Match. Again, this is Rose and Susan who were in the documentary. And that's, if you talk about surrogacy, that's who you would be talking to. This is my surrogate baby down on the bottom. And the important thing is to have a professional team. You, have, you want a, an attorney who is going to be able to really protect you and give you a contract that makes sure it covers everything and makes you the parent. You know, it's um, if you don't have the right language, she can't go to court and get a judgment. So it's important to have a really experienced attorney. Michelle's been doing this for 15 years, Michelle, 16 years. Um, and Dr. Ringler has great success. So it's important when you put together a team that you do have an attorney who is experienced, a doctor who is successful, and an agency that is committed to having everything done to make this a success for you. Just want to end with saying during COVID, it's a very challenging time. We have had a few surrogates that did get COVID while they were pregnant. Um, I'm happy to say that there were no long-term effects. They delivered healthy babies and they are fine. Some of our donors, sadly, have ended up testing positive for COVID. And um, there is a delay in cycles when that happens and it's for your protection and for the protection of the fetus. So please stay safe during this time. And I'm gonna now turn it over to Michelle. So good evening, everybody. My name is Michelle Keyes. I am an attorney with Reproductive Law Center. We're based here in California. Uh, our firm works really across the United States um, in any state where surrogacy is legal. Um, so if you have a surrogate or egg donor in another state outside of California, um, we can also assist you in that case. I'm gonna go ahead and start my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. So typically um, our job, we start, our, we come in when um, you've seen the doctor and you've gone to the agency, they've matched you with a donor or a surrogate. Um, typically they've also gone through medical screening already with your IVF clinic. And then our job is to help with the legal steps. Um, so the first step in an egg donation or a surrogacy is going to be a, a contract between you 
and your donor or your surrogate. And so our job would be to draft that contract. We would then review it with you. Uh, usually we can do that over the phone or by uh, Zoom or Skype. And once you're happy with the draft, it would go over to an attorney that is representing your surrogate or donor. So she will have a separate attorney um, that she works with and they'll do a review with her and we'll assist you in negotiating any changes to that contract and uh, with providing you instructions on finalizing it. And then once everybody has signed the contract, we send a legal clearance letter to both the doctor and the agency. And that lets them know that the legal process has been done. Uh, your surrogate or donor cannot start the actual cycle medications until that uh, legal clearance is sent. Uh, so general timing for that process is about two to three weeks, just dependent on uh, the parties involved. And um, what I, you know, Darlene talked a lot about requirements and what you wanna consider when you're matching. Those are all things that the agency will share with us uh, in a referral document. And that's what we use to draft your contract. So a lot of those topics that you'll discuss with the agency, with the surrogate, uh, those will be included in your contract. And so like Darlene said, it's very important to think about those things ahead of time. Make sure that the donor or surrogate that you're matching with feels the same way um, on some of those issues. So that's the first step in the legal process. The second step in the legal process is gonna to be to get you a parentage order or a pre-birth order here in California. Um, so the process can be different depending on the state where your surrogate resides. Um, so you wanna make sure you have an attorney that is experienced in, in that state. But typically uh, it's a pre-birth order court process. So we would, draft court documents for you. Uh, you would sign those, your surrogate would sign those. Your IVF doctor will also sign a declaration uh, explaining the process that they went through. And that is then filed with the court. The court reviews the file and will grant the judgment of parentage. And so that judgment will declare that you are the sole legal parents of the child that is scheduled to be born to your surrogate and that the surrogate is not the legal parent of the child that's due to be born. So that pre-birth order, we start the process once you've um, gotten out of the first trimester of the pregnancy. We want to make sure that the pregnancy is you know, doing well. So we would typically start that around 13 to 14 weeks into the pregnancy. And then it's usually we have a final judgment around week 28 to 30. So that gives us plenty of time to then contact the hospital. We provide them with a copy of the judgment and a letter from myself with instructions on what they need to do on their end. We also provide you with a packet that has all the documents and information that you'll need uh, to provide to the hospital, um, to obtain the birth certificate, for the hospital to give you uh, physical custody of the baby and those types of things. And so that leads me to post-birth steps, which is also part of what we would assist you with. So for international intended parents, typically you would, in a normal situation, you would need to plan to be in the US for at least three to four weeks after the birth. That will allow you time to obtain the birth certificate, uh, to get a US passport for your baby, which they will be entitled to because your child will be a US citizen automatically upon birth. And then for many um, international intended parents, you'll also need to consult with your consulate here in the US uh, in terms of citizenship uh, and or travel documents that you may need to travel home with your child. Um, for most international intended parents, you will be able to travel home with just the US passport. And then you can work on obtaining citizenship, and other travel documents uh, for your country once you've returned home. So with COVID, we obviously have some different expectations. Um, right now with our clients that are traveling internationally, you can expect to uh, need to stay in the US somewhere between six to 10 weeks after birth right now. 
And the reason for that is that um, our passport system, our passport offices are uh, running sort of a skeleton crew. Many of the offices are closed. They are not offering the expedited passport services that our clients would typically take advantage of. So to get a passport right now, we're looking at about six to eight weeks. Uh, my feeling is that it's, it's getting better. You know, the rates in the US are going down, things are looking better. So I, as the rates start to go down, the State Department will open up more and more of their passport offices and return to doing the expedited services. So I hope by the summer that we'll be back to pretty much pre-COVID timing for that. One other consideration for our international clients right now with COVID is being able to enter the US because the US has travel restrictions and travel bans in place for many countries, uh, particularly Europe and, and China. So um, in order to come to the US for the birth of your child, you would need to apply with the US consulate in your country for an exception to the travel ban. Um, and all of our international clients from Europe have had 100% um, success in getting that exception granted and being able to get here for the birth. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward process. You email the consulate, you provide them with documentation of the, the birth and the surrogacy. My office provides you know, a letter and um, they were, they've been able to get that uh, travel exception and be able to travel here to the US. I mean, one of the other exceptions to the US travel ban that's currently in place is if you already have a child that is a US citizen, you're automatically able to travel to the US. That's an automatic exception. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, if you're not able to be here for the birth of your child, whether it's because of COVID or, you know, even some other reasons, you know, we have options in terms of naming a guardian that can be here. Uh, we can draft guardianship and power of attorney documents for you that will allow your designated guardian to go to the hospital and take custody of the child uh, until you're able to travel here. And so that's typically the legal process that's involved. Um, I normally do an, an um, initial consultation with my clients that lasts about an hour. So there's obviously more detail to the process, but that's the basics that you would need to kind of know going into it. So Juan, I think I'll turn it over to you for questions. So yes, thank you, uh, Michelle. Thank you for that. We have already a few questions over here. So let's start with the, with the first one. Um, can I sorry? Can you address surrogacy with two dads, both of whom are sperm donors? How do you do both IVF and surrogacy agency? Help them navigate decisions relating to which sperm to use. Do you ever recommend dual embryo implantation for twins? So Dr. Riggler and then Darlene. Sure, no, I, I have a lot of gay couples where they are each a sperm provider. And as I mentioned at the time of egg retrieval, we would divide the eggs into two equal groups to create embryos with each sperm provider so that at the end of the treatment cycle, you'll know how many, and if we're doing genetic testing, you know how many normal embryos you have for each sperm provider. Now, the, the genetic testing also includes the gender. You will know how many normal males and females for each sperm provider. So then when we're ready, after you've been matched with a surrogate, um, you and she completes her screening, we're ready to plan the transfer. Um, and the decision is really has to be made at the time of the surrogate match, whether you're going to transfer one or two embryos, because as Darlene mentioned, the surrogate, of course, has to be willing to carry twins if that's um, going to be an option. And we have to make sure she's a good candidate for twins. Not every sur surrogate is medically going to be an ideal candidate for twins. So we have the option of transferring one or two embryos. You can transfer one embryo from each intended parent into the surrogate. And what I'm seeing more and more of, of for uh, men who want two babies near the same time is to use two surrogates and transfer, do a single embryo transfer into each <coughs> of the two surrogates. 
it's safer that way. As an agency, we will help people either find a surrogate willing to carry twins or as Dr. Ringler said, what we're seeing more of now is actually choosing two surrogates and having single embryo transfers. And the reason for that is that monetarily, it actually ends up not costing more if you end up with a premature birth and you have to be in the States for a really long time. You have large hospital bills. And so a lot of people are opting to choose two surrogates. And um, I would say too, when you're, when you're looking at this, really consider what Dr. Ringler has to say. We always, you know, surrogates are gonna say, yes, I'm, I'm happy to do more than one, but is it the safest thing for her? And as Dr. Ringler said, not all surrogates should be carrying twins. So, but we've had very successful twin pregnancies. It used to be the way, right, Dr. Ringler? We had so right. many. 50, 60 percent um, were twins, but there were a lot of premature births and a lot of complications. So this is, is definitely the safest way to go. And agencies are willing to help you find two surrogates who, are, who will do this and carry one from each parent. And I would just add to that, that you would also want to consider the, the medical costs of the babies after birth. You know, typically twins can be born premature, they will need more hospital care. Um, medical expenses in the US for international clients can be quite expensive for, for the babies. So that is something to consider. Thank you, everyone. Another question, is a surrogate screened or cleared based on prescribed medications they take? Are prescribed medications disclosed to those of us considering a surrogate? Sure, uh, the surrogate undergoes complete <clears throat> medical screening. Uh, you know, I take a thorough medical history to find out any medical problems that she may have. And we review all the medication that she's taking to make sure she's not taking anything that could pose a risk to the future child during the pregnancy. As an agency, we believe in complete transparency. And so we want you to know everything about your surrogate any complications that she's had, any medications that she's on, any stressors in her life. That's really important that you understand those. Um, with COVID, I just want to, I meant to say this before and I wanna put this out there now. Um, I know that a lot of times it's not recommended in Europe for pregnant women to have the vaccine. So it's really important when you're matching with a surrogate that you agree on whether she will or will not take the vaccine before you finalize your match. And, um, you know, some surrogates are in a position where they are medical care uh, people and they are obligated to take it through their work. And so it's possible she could lose her job. We have one surrogate that gave up her job because they, it was mandatory and her family did not want her to have the vaccine. So when you're talking about medications, also please consider how you feel about the vaccine and whether you want her to have it or not. And that's something that we would also address in the contract with you and your surrogate are some COVID considerations right now, particularly the vaccine. Thanks everyone. We have a, a question related to twins uh, from our Facebook. We are actually uh, live on Facebook as well. Um, what is the percentage of chances that two embryos will stay for twins in the clinic, Dr. Wimler? That's a good question. Um, when we, it's approximately 50%. So even though we transfer two embryos, doesn't guarantee a twin pregnancy. Um, so it's, that's an important consideration because if we have a gay couple and they transfer two embryos of the same gender, and we end up with a singleton, you won't know who the biological dad is, of course, until the, the birth of the baby and you do genetic testing. If you transfer opposite genders, of course, you're gonna know who the um, biological dad is. Thank you, Dr. Ringler. So we have a question. We are in Europe, we're from Europe, and we have an egg donor. Is it possible the entry in the USA with a doctor invitation to complete the egg donation and the sperm donation 
Otherwise, what options do we have to make the egg donation without putting at risk the quality of the eggs, Dr. Ringler? That's a great question. <laughs> I wish I had a great answer. Um, we've had, you know, now six months ago, we had international egg donors coming into the, the U.S. To, to do egg donation cycles, and then it almost seemed like they abruptly st stopped allowing them to, to come in. So recently, we haven't had international donors able to travel to the U.S. Um, Darlene, do you have any experience with international donors? I've had experience where families had a donor, a family member or a friend that they wanted to work with and had them come in from Europe. Yeah. So I had, um, I did one recruitment for a Czechoslovakian donor and we did a cycle with that person, but since COVID, we really haven't. And right now, Dr. Ringler and I actually have a case together where we're going to have to delay the cycle, hopefully until summer when, you know, and travel arrangements restrictions will be lifted because we can't really get the donor here. Um, but we do work with people who have their own known donors and want to bring them here. And so it's just different language in the contract. As an agency, we, you know, we reduce our fee because we're not recruiting this person for you and stuff. And then Dr. Ringler can have arranged for all the testing of everybody. Um, so he would address that more, whether he could test a donor in UK or Germany. And I, I would just add from the legal side of it, right now it's not possible to have a donor come in from any of the countries that there's a travel ban on. Even with a letter from the doctor, from me, uh, we've actually tried, it's not, not possible. Um, you know, a couple options. Once the travel ban is lifted, then of course it will be hopefully travel as usual. You can have your donors come over. You know, in a extreme situations, it may be possible if your donor was willing to go to another country to quarantine for 14 days, that would have to be a country in which the US does not currently have a travel ban imposed. So they could go to that country, quarantine for 14 days, and then they should be able to enter the US that way. So that, that is a potential possibility. In the, but the in that case, I'm sorry, Dr. Ring, we're going uh, ahead. I was, I was just gonna say the good news is summer is right around the corner and we're hoping that travel restrictions will um, be released by summer to allow um, these international donors to come to the US. I was going to ask you too, even if we brought a donor in and quarantined her for a few weeks, because of the timing of having to do FDA testing and possibly genetic testing, would two weeks pre-quarantine, how long would she still have to remain in the country to complete a cycle? Well, the treatment cycle itself is approximately two weeks and we always obtain the FDA infectious disease test before we start treatment. Um, we're able to get those results back usually within three or four days. So, you know, two and a half weeks should be okay. Think, thanks everyone. Another question, how long before an intended birth should we start working with the IVF clinic and the surrogacy agency? You know, I think this is a common question. How long does it take between now and when my baby arrives? And I think it's somewhere between a year and a half to two years is a, is a realistic window. Um, and sometimes it's a little quicker, sometimes a little bit slower. I think um, once we have sperm frozen um, and you have an egg donor selected, we can be creating embryos about six weeks later. Once we have embryos frozen, there's maybe a little delay to be matched with the surrogate anywhere from one to six months, depending on uh, surrogates. Once we have a surrogate identified, we can be doing an embryo transfer in about six weeks. So it tends to all add up to somewhere around um, 18 months. Would you say, do you agree, Michelle and Darlene? I would say, you know, our goal certainly is from the time that someone chooses to work with us, that they would have a child in a year because it takes 
three months just to go through the process of having the, the I mean, sorry, the surrogate, having a surrogate screened, um, you know, and prepped, ready to go for an embryo transfer. And so I would encourage you to first choose your clinic. This is my personal opinion. First choose your clinic because the clinic is going to determine what requirements they have for surrogates. So I could have 10 surrogates and if they don't meet Dr. Ringler's requirements, then it's, it's not really going to matter. But you can create your embryos first. That's the most important part is to have embryos. And then we can find a surrogate for you usually within a couple of months. One thing to consider when you're from certain countries, it's um, advised, it, it's not necessary, but advised that you have an unmarried surrogate. And maybe Michelle can talk about that a little bit more, but an unmarried <coughs> surrogate um, because of the, the post-birth or pre-birth judgment, who's going to be named as the parents. So finding a qualified unmarried surrogate is a little bit more difficult. And so if you have that requirement, you, would, you should contact an agency too. Many of our surrogates will wait while you create embryos, but really I think it's find out the, your clinic that you wanna work with, find an agency that you wanna work with. And then, sorry, Michelle, you're last on my list. No. <laughs> um, then have a consult with um, an attorney to make sure that everything is, is in place. But our goal is one year. And that depends on Dr. Ringler's success. <laughs> All on you, Dr. Thank Ringler. You. <laughs> Thank you. So Michelle, we have a bunch of questions for you now. Um, if when there's a medical decision to be made during the pregnancy and before the pre-birth order is effective, what determines my rights in making those decisions versus a surrogate's rights to make those decisions? Is that covered by legal agreement between me and the surrogate? Okay, great question. So yes, it is covered by the legal agreement. I do want to clarify that that pre-birth order that we're getting, even though we obtain it during the pregnancy, it's not mm -hmm. legally effective until the moment of birth. So from the moment of birth, that child is yours. You make all medical decisions concerning the baby. During the pregnancy, it's a little bit different. You will agree with your surrogate in the contract on the parameters of who can make decisions based on the situation. Typically, if the situation involves anything to do with the surrogate's health or life, if it could be a danger to her, ultimately it is gonna be her decision to make. If it's something to do uh, with the fetus that can be done without you know, big risk to the surrogate, then typically that would be the intended parent's decision to make. And that's all stated in the contract. Again, that's a reason to really understand what you want before you match with a surrogate so that you match with a surrogate of like mind. Thank you. This is a question about egg donor, uh, about egg donor's name on birth certificates. So we don't, uh, there's really no way to put an egg donor's name on a birth certificate. However, we understand for some of our international clients, um, in order to return to their country and get citizenship for the child, they need to have basically a man and a woman on the birth certificate. Um, so in those situations, uh, we are able in some states, particularly in California, to list the surrogate on the initial birth certificate with uh, one of the fathers. Um, and then after they've obtained citizenship in their country, we can go back in California, we can go back and amend the birth certificate to remove the surrogate and add the other father. Um, or if it's a single man, then we just take her off. Um, so that's done through the pre-birth order process. I do want to clarify, though, that the judgment we get for you will still be very clear that you are the legal parents and the surrogate is not. She has no legal rights. She's not really considered a parent. But because of the way our, our vital records birth certificate statutes are written, it does allow her name to go on the original birth certificate. 
Thank Which you. Again, really Michelle, is that a reason to have a, a married surrogate? Not typically. Um, in California, we can put the surrogate on with one of the intended parents and it won't matter if she's married. Will it matter in their country though? If so, there's yeah. in, in some countries, uh, you know, it's becoming less and less that this is needed, but in some countries, intended parents may need to have an unmarried surrogate because it's easier for them to gain citizenship um, or even entry back into the country after birth. Thank you. So we have a general question really is applicable to everyone is how do we sign legal documents as an international intended parent? Yeah. So for our egg donor contracts, um, those you can sign, uh, just sign and scan and email it back to us. Um, it, we don't require an original in most cases. For the surrogacy contracts, uh, we will ultimately need an original copy from both parties. Tip, what we're doing right now with COVID is most parents are signing it through an online notary service. So we have online notary services in the US. It's just a website. You go on and make an appointment and you'll do like a Zoom call with the notary and you'll sign the surrogacy contract in front of the notary and then they'll, they'll notarize it electronically. And so you'll end up sending us um, the contract after you've done that. Typically when we're not dealing with COVID, we ask that our clients attempt to go in person to an, either a notary in their country, or if that's not possible, you can usually get an appointment at a US consulate and have it notarized there. Um, but right now the courts are accepting the online notary. And I think that'll start becoming more of a, a popular thing in the future now too. Thank you, Michelle. A uh, question for Darlene, I think, what financial advantages do a gay couple have to use two surrogates at the same time, that's what we call a dual journey, right, compared to two processes one after another, which would be a sibling journey. Greetings from Switzerland. And hi, Arne, how are you? Um, greetings to you as well. I, that's why I was smiling. If anyone was wondering why I kept smiling, I saw who it was. Um, the advantage, cost-wise, I would say it's probably, the problem with having two surrogates is you never know if they're actually going to give birth at the same time. So you could end up having one deliver prematurely and you have to be here for that birth. And then the other one comes later or she's in another city. So it's, it's a way of doing it faster to have them at the same time but most of my clients prefer to have one, they work with their same surrogate oftentimes for both of their um, pregnancies. So it depends on how complicated you want your life more than I think financially. Uh, financially, I don't think there's much difference other than like I said, if one has a, a, a birth sooner, you have to be here longer. Um, but the cost for the surrogates remains the same. The cost for the treatment, I don't know if Dr. Ringler has a package deal for two. We do, we have a package deal for two, but we offer that same package deal, whether you have them at the same time or you come back and you do a sibling journey with um, another surrogate. Yeah, same for the legal side. Same for the legal side. I had, I had a recent case with two surrogates for the same intended parents, and they were, they were scheduled to deliver three weeks apart. They ended up going into labor the same day. The babies were born three hours apart. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Both, both term, doing well. The obstetrician at the same hospital walked down <laughs> the hall to do the second delivery. If hard. you're gonna do this, if you're going to do two surrogates, it's really important that you consider the, the uh, geographical area of right. them. So if you can have two surrogates in the same city, which is our goal, if we do two yeah. surrogates, same, same city. So when you come, you can take care of your babies at the same hospital. Um, we've had, not we, but I have had friends who have had surrogates deliver on separate coasts. And it's really, really difficult for families. So if you're going to do it, please give that consideration of choosing two surrogates in the same location. 
Yeah, even if in just different cities, I had clients that had two surrogates at the same time, both in California, but pretty far apart. Um, and they went into labor right around the same time. And so the parents had to split up. One went to one city and one went to another. So it's not an ideal situation for, for you. Thanks, thanks everyone. So we have a medical question about vaccine. What is the protocol for COVID-19 vaccine and egg retrieval? Does she need to wait a few months after the vaccine was given to be able to come for egg retrieval, Dr. Ringler? The, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, we don't uh, require, of course, we don't require our egg donors to have the vaccine and um, we don't test the egg donors for COVID unless they're, they are ill um, for surrogates, we always test them prior to conception, so before an embryo transfer. Um, if an egg donor has had the vaccine, it will not interfere with her treatment in any way. So the timing of that vaccine really doesn't matter. I yes, like I think that's, that was the question. Yeah. If I can respond to that, please. Because I work with donors throughout the nation, I work with many clinics. And um, every clinic has its own protocol. Dr. Ringler has uh, some protocols that I just discovered yesterday that um, you know, are, are a little bit different. But I recently had a case where um, one clinic wanted the donor to wait. This is without a vaccine, just three months from the time she tested positive. And then also one month from the time that they had the vaccine, the second round of vaccines. So not the first one, the second one. Um, another clinic had six months after receiving the vaccine. So it's important to understand that each clinic will possibly have a different protocol. And um, same with the surrogate. They may have very different protocols as far as the COVID vaccine. Thanks everyone. And uh, well, it looks like we have come to our last question tonight. Uh, do the proven egg donors have genetic testing done and which records can be accessed via an egg donor portal? Every, every egg donor, whether she's a first time donor or um, a repeat donor has, will have had genetic testing. Um, first time donors um, have genetic carrier screening. They also have, have an interview a screening by a a geneticist to go over the family history. Um, if it's a repeat donor, whether or not we repeat the genetic carrier screening depends on when it was done, what, you know, how extensive it was. Oftentimes um, we need to repeat it to make sure that everything that the sperm provider was tested for is on the egg donor panel. There's multiple companies today. The panels can range from 15 diseases to 300 diseases. And so we have to make sure that, it, that everyone is tested um, for the same diseases. As an agency, that's one of the things that we gather and we give to, um, to the clinic. So if, if it's a previous donor, we receive all of her records, which will include her previous genetic testing. And we will, we will send that to the clinic. Oftentimes an intended parent may, you know, could have their own condition that they want to make sure the donor doesn't have as well. And so the clinic will compare the donor's genetic testing with that of the parents. And a lot of times they end up having the donor repeat her testing from the same company as the um, intended father. So just, it gives you a picture of what she might be a carrier for or that she is clear but as Dr. Ringler said, sometimes it's a very limited panel and other times it is a huge panel. And uh, so it's really up to the clinic to determine if there's further genetic testing that needs to be done. But the agency should be getting those medical records and sending them to the clinic. Thank you. And we have here our last minute question. Am I able to select the agenda I want to have, Dr. Ringler? When we do um, pre-implantation genetic testing of the embryos, we're screening for the number of chromosomes and we're looking for abnormalities in chromosome number, 
Um, so if they have an extra chromosome, if they're missing a chromosome, it can be identified. If there are rearrangements of chromosomes, uh, one broken off onto another, or deletion of one, uh, duplication of part of one, it will identify those, those abnormalities. Genetic uh, testing includes the gender, so we will know how many ma male embryos we have, how many female embryos we have. As an Excellent. agency, I just want to add that if you want to do gender selection, it's very important in your, in your choice of donors. So as Dr. Ringler was saying, his ideal is 20 to 30 um, eggs so that he can end up with four to six, four to eight embryos. Part of that is that when you're doing the genetic testing of these embryos and you find out this has happened to one of my clients, he ended up with eight embryos that were all not the gender he wanted. So, you know, you when you're doing that and you, if you're choosing a donor, first of all, if you have two men that are going to be fertilizing eggs, you want to have a donor who has a lot of follicles because you're going to lose embryos just during this process. If you add gender uh, choice on top of that, you are reducing the number again. So when you are looking at a donor, make sure that the doctor knows this, the agency knows this, so they can guide you to a donor that should give you the best chance of success. Thank you, Darlene. So that was our last question tonight. So I would like to thank everybody for your participation, for your attendance. I hope it was uh, helpful information. I'm sure it was. I think it was an excellent uh, session that we had tonight. I will be reaching out to everybody tomorrow with the link to the recorded webinar, also with the contact details of our speakers. So you can set up one-to-one -one call to consults with them if you wish. And uh, have a lovely evening and rest of the day. Dr. Ringler, Michelle, Darlene, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You for everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.